Hey, our church. Thanks so much for watching our online church. If we've never met, my name is Brandon, and I'm so grateful that you're watching. Behind me is Saturday Night Church. Today, we had our 9, 30, and 11. It was amazing, and of course, you're gonna love online church tonight. And uh, what you're about to see is uh, what happened last weekend at our Easter weekend with all of the kids, 10,000 eggs, 1,400 people. It's amazing. And immediately following that, Dean's got an incredible message. We've been baptizing people all weekend long. It's amazing. I thank you for being a part of our church. Enjoy this message. nice night. Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Open it up on your phone, however you want to do it. It's going to be on the screen. I think we all know that. But it's a good discipline to open the book. Get comfortable with the book. The book to the Corinthians, it's one of the only books in the Bible where they don't tell you who the author is. It's a debate about it. A lot of theologians think it was one of uh, Paul, uh, a woman who was a, a disciple, a protege of Paul's. Other people think it was Paul himself because it reflects a lot of the things that Paul wrote. Sure seems like it's Paul to me. So when I say the writer, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining Paul. You can imagine whoever you like. Uh, th this last weekend... At Easter, Easter is always about Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Yeah, it's about Jesus and what he did. And last weekend, I talked about the fact that he was more than a man and that he, he came for us and that he's coming. Jesus has done everything he needs to do but one thing, come again. And by the way, he's welcome to come anytime as far as I'm concerned because this place is a mess. The Seahawks don't even have a quarterback. I'm just telling you, this world, this world has fallen apart. You know what I'm saying? That was supposed to be funny. All the Russell Wilson people, tear in the eye. Uh, but today, this weekend, I want to talk about you and your part in the equation. Because, you know, if this were a graph, Jesus' part would be like this. Steady. The scripture says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never wavers. There is no sign of wavering in him. No fluctuation. Can I hear an amen? He doesn't love you more when you do good. He doesn't love you less when you do bad. He loves you with an unfailing, unremitting love. So that's Jesus. And this is Dean, you know, up and down, moods, behaviors, just a mess. Sometimes I know a lot about a subject. Sometimes I forget a lot about a subject. I'm the problem. Everybody say that. Say I'm the problem. You're talking about yourself, not about me. Some of you said you're the problem. That's not what I said. I didn't say, re say that I was the problem. I said, yourself, right? And so today I want to talk about how we think. In 1 Corinthians, I'm going to begin with verse 3. This is chapter 12. The writer is talking about 
how Jesus' spirit works in us. Now remember, Jesus doesn't change, we do. And he says, I want to impart, I want to give you impartation, an understanding of the following. No one, everybody say no one. No one speaks by the, who speaks by the spirit of, ever, of God would ever say Jesus is the accursed one. So the writer here is saying, if somebody's cursing Jesus, that's not God. That's not God. There was a show on PBS a few years ago with a guy, I loved his books. His name is Wayne Dyer. He's now in hell. But are you paying attention yet? I don't know if he's in hell. Thank goodness I'm not in charge, right? I loved his books and I loved his talks. He's super motivational. And on this one on this one PBS show, PBS, Public Broadcasting System, he says, this is the most important sentence in, in all of history. And he said, here it is, three words. I am God. And I'm like waiting for a lightning bolt to come. Anybody who says stuff like that, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's Wayne that's uh, deviant theology, but that's not God. I can remember one time, I remember reading in the Tacoma News Tribune that a mother dumped her child in the dumpster at South Center Mall. And it was right after I had read a book talking about how we are enlightened beings. I got news for you. Enlightened beings don't drop their kids in the garbage can. You are not God. But when one says Jesus is, the, is Lord Yahweh, you can't say that on the other end of the extreme unless the Holy Spirit is speaking through you. So in the same way, you could see somebody who still has a drug problem, who still drinks a little too much. Do you know anybody like this? Somebody who still loses their temper every once in a while. But if they have the, the knowledge and the wherewithal to say Jesus is Lord, that person is speaking through by the Holy Spirit. Which means that you could be a pretty moral person and be filled with the wrong spirit, or you could be a pretty flawed person and still be full of the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad? Because I don't think anybody in here is gonna be nominated for Pope. He says, it is the same spirit who continues, this Holy Spirit, to distribute many different varieties of gifts. The Holy Spirit is distributing He's a dealer, and he's dealing gifts. The Lord Yahweh is one, and he is the one who apportions to believers different varieties of ministries. The same God distributes different kinds of miracles. So God is giving gifts, which is, you know, like this, something you haven't earned. That's the definition of a gift, is something that belongs to somebody else. It's given to you because of who the gift giver is, not because of who you are. It's a reflection of how they see you. They see you as a person of value, as someone important to them, so they give you a gift. And the writer here is saying the Holy Spirit gives everybody a gift. He gives everybody a ministry. He gives everybody miracles. Everybody. Different ministries, different miracles, different gifts. But if you're in this room, Jesus, his Holy Spirit, the Father in heaven, have distributed to you gifts. You have miracles coming through you. You haven't seen some of them yet, but they're coming through you. And it says, uh, and he does this to accomplish different results, different results, does that say different results? Does it say different results? I don't care how nice a day it is. You're going you're gonna to play with me tonight, okay? Does it say different results? 
Yeah, not the same results. You don't have to get the same results that I do. I don't have to pretend to be you. We're not trying conformity here. We do unity for maximum impact. We don't do conformity because God isn't giving you the same thing he's giving me and he's not doing a miracle through you the way he's doing it through Kyle. But he's going for different results through different people. Through each person's gift and ministry, he energizes and activates them. Each believer is given continuous revelation by the Holy Spirit to benefit not just himself or herself, but all. Is that not a cool chunk? And when I read it, and I reread it, and I reread it, I thought, okay. We already know Jesus is like that, and Dean is like that. How can I get Dean to be more consistently like Jesus? Because we, uh, we tend to act on things we believe, and we don't even know what we believe until we see ourselves act. Do you know what I'm saying? In 1938, when, let me back up because I wasn't alive in 1938. But when I was in middle school, for history class, they had a study a radio show. And I forget exactly what the topic was or why we were studying it, but there was a radio show that they made us listen to in its entirety from October of 1938. And it was a radio show by a guy named Orson Welles. Have you ever heard that name? Wave your hand. And it was a radio show based on a book. It was called War of the Worlds. And some of you um, remember this, but in October 1938, what happened was the, this radio broadcast was done about an alien invasion. And I know somebody, was it Tom Cruise or somebody redid the movie, yes? Melanie's like, ah, she hasn't even seen Star Wars. I don't know. But um, I've been hard on Melanie the last two weeks. <laughs> but what happened in 1938 was they did it like a broadcast as if aliens really were taking over and invading the United States. Wave your hand if you remember this at all. Yeah. And people started jumping out of windows, committing suicide. In New York City, there were traffic jams. So many people trying to get out of town because they believed it. That's why people jump out of windows when you're a radio show talking about aliens. Because I don't care if they were a stockbroker or a police officer or a fireman or a mechanic. Nobody takes a header from the 12th floor over alien invasion unless you believe in aliens. <laughs> right? The police showed up at the radio station and tried to arrest Orson Welles and his crew to get them to stop because mass hysteria broke out in America. So when I was in middle school, they, they took this thing and they talked about mass hysteria and how people can be watching the same event and having a totally different experience. You and I can be, it's like you and I are watching the same movie, but you come out and you say it was a love story and I come out and I say it was a war story. You're like, we were in the same theater on the same screen, but did we see a different movie? And you say to yourself, that doesn't happen anymore. That's in 1938, except half of America believes the, the election in, in 2018 was stolen, and the other half believes that the election four years later was stolen. And they're both willing to do crazy things because they believe. Yeah? yeah? Everybody in here acts with great fervor based on what you believe. So we say, God is in control. He's in charge. 
the, I'm trying to think of things that Jesus people say on Easter Sunday. He's whatever, and then we lose our job and we lose our mind. Because we can say God is our provider, but I can tell what you believe by what makes you jump out the window. You know what I'm saying? And it's easy to go, 1938, those people believed in Martians and little men. I know, I know. And in 2022, what do we believe? What do we believe? That inflation can be the Lord and master of our financial future? I mean, what are you willing to die for? What are you willing to fight for? What are you willing to leave somebody? Some of you lost friends over politics. I was reading Twitter the other day and I thought to myself, Jesus people hate so many different types of people. Sometimes it's hard to tell who they love. It's like, man, you know what I'm saying? I know you say that Jesus people love people, but what it seems like you believe is that your hate has to stop their behavior because God's love is too weak. You know? We got to put the screws to people because the Holy Spirit can't do it. You know what I'm saying? Here's how we get to what we believe. Agreement is the word. Everybody say agreement. If you've attended here for more than five minutes, you notice I work hard on getting people. When they come in here, we try to get you in agreement because we, we, we plan the music to be the truth of scripture. So when you sing scripture, you are getting in agreement melodiously with scripture and you are saying it out loud. This is my story. This is my song. You're the resurrection. You're the da da da. Right? You're getting in agreement. You believe what you have gotten in agreement with in regard to your thoughts. When somebody says to you, you are a waste of space. You are an idiot. If there's a part of you that starts walking around like an idiot, you got in agreement with that thought. If your ex, if your ex says to you, You'll, you're going to be alone for the rest of your life. I mean, I'm trying to think of some of the heinous things that we say to each other. And if we walk around, we lie in bed with our staring at the ceiling and we say, I guess I'm going to be alone. I don't want to be alone. And because you believe you're going to be alone, you start doing all sorts of things for people that don't value you and you drift into even worse behaviors. You know what I'm talking about? Why is that? Because you got in agreement with the thought that I'm going to be alone and by God, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to have to start doing things and pleasing people and doing the things that I shouldn't be doing to please people so I'm not alone. Agreement with thoughts, agreement with words. Sentences that are sad to you. Nobody in our family is ever going to be rich. We're going to die broke. I guess I'm going to have to work until the day I die. These are the things we say. We say out loud. We say out loud. And, you know, good people can love you. You know, I said this last weekend. But if somebody drops a little sugar in my coffee, does it hurt me? Some of you are like, well, sugar's not good for you. <laughs> How deep does he want to go? For, for the most part, if you drop sugar in my coffee, it makes it sweeter, yes? Okay. So if an enemy drops sugar in my coffee, is that good? It's okay. Now, if, if I drop a little strychnine in my coffee, is that okay? No, different thing. If a friend accidentally drops strychnine in my coffee, does that make it okay? No. So the point is, you got to watch your coffee. <laughs> because a friend can give you something that poisons you, even on accident, 
And an enemy might say something that blesses you. This is why you gotta listen to everybody. But you gotta filter everybody too. Because you are the thoughts and words you got in agreement with. I was talking to my dad about cars. I love cars. I've had beautiful cars. Porsche and Maserati and I mean all kinds of different Mercedes and I like to go through cars. And uh, it's a pleasure. And so I was talking to my dad. How many of you know life should be enjoyed? Yeah. Not just endured. Relax, you don't pay me so I can talk about whatever. Uh, life should be enjoyed, yes? Yeah, you're not just supposed to endure this. So, so I like to enjoy those sorts of things. And I was saying to my dad, does my dad love me? Some of you are like, I don't know. The answer is yes. Everybody say yes. And I said, Dad. He asked me, what, what was your, what's your next car going to be? I said, Dad, my next dream car is I want to have a Ferrari Roma. And he said, no. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not asking you to pay for it, man. And I said, yes. And he goes, they break down. I said, Dad, if you can afford a Ferrari Roma, you can get it fixed. But in his head, that was like too expensive to fix. If it's too expensive to buy, it's too expensive to fix. Can I get an amen? But he, he, I said it, and he didn't want to get in agreement with it. So then I could go, yeah, you're right, Dad. I guess I'll never have it. And that interaction tells me a couple of things. Number one, he'll never have it, right? And I will. I don't know how, but everybody in here becomes the thought, the word, and the action that they get in alignment with. The Apostle Paul, when he's writing Corinthians, he says, you can't say Jesus is accursed and be full of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because that sentence is not in alignment or in agreement with Scripture. And the Holy Spirit is always moving you into alignment with Scripture. So you say, oh my gosh, I don't want to be that kind of person. I don't want to be that kind of, you, you know how powerful thoughts are? Why is pornography such a powerful idea? Because you can imagine something that will give you a physical response identical to a physical act. That's how powerful your mind is. That when we, then we, we immerse ourselves in something, it takes us over. And, but the thing isn't really that we're being taken over by pornography 24 seven, what we're really being taken over by is more like fear and skepticism and cynicism and attacking each other and ripping each other apart. And then we get up in the morning and we feel terrible. Here's the first question. If you really wanna change your consistency level and start getting in alignment with great stuff. The question, first question is, how do I feel? How do I feel? A lot of you, we just get up and we say, I don't feel good. And then we accept that. We just like live in it and we soak in it. I haven't felt good in years. <laughs> it would be like getting up every morning and saying, I feel heavy. And then going down and having some ice cream. The point is not to have the feeling. The point is to ask yourself the question, how do I feel? And number two, is this the way I want to feel? And what thought can I get? In, how do I really want to feel? And what thought can I get in alignment with? Because if I get up and I feel heavy, but I say, okay, I feel heavy, and I don't want to feel like that anymore, so I better get walking. I gotta get my steps in today. I gotta get my 10,000 steps and I gotta, I better throw that ice cream out. The other day we had a party at the house with, for Easter and Brandon and Reagan and a bunch of friends were there. 
chemo and Ariel, and we had a great time. At the end, there was a chunk of carrot cake like that left. You know what I'm saying? And I had already had one. And then a follow-up one, you know? <laughs> and the second one, I sent truly to get it. And I just wanted a sliver. <laughs> but I knew by sending the kid, I'd get a pretty good size. And I ate that one too. And at the end of the night, Reagan says, do you want the, this leftover piece? And I said, yes, I want it. But you better throw it away because I want it. And you know what Reagan said? I should probably put, put some water on top of it too, huh? Because she knows me. Like, she'd be leaving, I'd be in the window waving goodbye, and then I'd go into the garbage. You know what I'm talking about? Catch me elbow deep, trying to fish out the carrot cake. What do you, what do you feel, and, and do you want to feel that way? And say, okay, so, then what do I know? It's the second question. What do I know? This is why it's so important to come to church. I know people say, oh, it doesn't matter. Come to church. It's, it's original. That's because you, you're, 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 you're not thoughtful and intentional about what you know. But you, we read scripture in the morning and we pray in the morning because we're reciting what we know about God. Because you turn on your little phone, you flip through, and it's bad news, bad news, bad news, scrolling, hate, 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 toxic, 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 clickbait, clickbait, clickbait. And the aliens are coming. And it may, you better jump out the window. That's what it's saying. They, they're invading. And if you don't know the right things, you find out you're doing behaviors you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. So you say like, 50% of marriages end in divorce. That's not the right thing to know. The right thing to know is that God ordains marriages. Right. He can restore anything in right. Jesus' name. He can bring you back from the brink. Yeah. And by the way, he can take somebody who's gone through the most wicked divorce and bring somebody into their life that is the person of their dreams. That God has a plan and a future for you. These are things I know. Jeremiah 11. He has a plan for your future and it's good. And I recite these things when I pray in the morning. I have a friend who, who uh, came out of recovery three and a half years ago. And as a favor, his mom said to me, will you, will you call him every morning to help him stay sober? And I said, no. But if he calls me, I'll answer. And every day for three and a half years, this brother has called me. He called me this morning. And we're on the phone for about 45 seconds. I say, how you doing, brother? Are you sober? He says, yeah. I said, let's pray. And some days I pray, and some days he prays, but what we pray is what we know. God, you want me to be sober. Your plan for me is great. You're gonna bring the right woman into my life. You are gonna provide for my family. He's looking for a house. God, you've got just the right house for him. Amen. You could say, well, I feel like it's really hard to get a house. Pretty crazy market. Or he could say, I know how I feel, but what I know is God has just the right place for me. Yeah. And what do I want? Those three questions. What do I want? Not what do I wish for, but what do I want enough to pray for? You know? Say, well, I mean, I want a great marriage. Do you want to go to counseling? No, it's not for me. Okay. What do you really want? You want it easy. Right? It's amazing what people will do for football. They'll get up at 5 a.m. They'll run around a field with the chance of maybe getting to lift a trophy a couple of months later. The same guys won't be bothered to go to counseling 
once every two weeks. They'll discipline their body, but they don't want to discipline their mind. They'll work on routes with teammates, but they don't want to work on a route with their spouse. They'll get their boat, hitch up the trailer at 4 a.m., drag it to some faraway lake in the pitch dark at the chance of maybe getting something on the line. Can I hear an amen? Why? Because you really, really want that. The same people that can't get up to an alarm clock at 9 a.m. for a job, pop out of bed at 5 a.m. to go skiing. Because that's what you really, really want. And scripture says that we're supposed to hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's like, man, I can't get to, can't wait. When's dinner? Like a kid, you know what I'm saying? When's dinner? When's dinner? What's for dinner? What's for lunch? In my family, I mean, we're, we're like two meals ahead in my family. It's like, it's lunchtime. I want to know what we're having for breakfast. You, you feel me, anybody here? Well, a lot of these sermons are cathartic about food for me for some reason, but it's, uh, it's a different kind of hunger. I was thinking about a breakthrough, for instance, that I've been looking for in my business, and I thought to myself, I haven't fasted once for that breakthrough. I mean, I can criticize you all day, but it's easier to criticize me. Not once. I pray about it. But I haven't developed like, okay, God, I'm going to put everything else aside and I'm going to grab the horns of the altar and get on my face until I get a breakthrough here. That's what I want. What do I feel? What do I know? What do I really want? And pay attention to what you do. Because what you do is what you really want. Yeah. Yeah. Will you stand with me? God. Father. Say Father. We know so much of this has already been done on the cross. The empty grave but I want to do my part to get the most out of my faith. I want it to be alive. I want it to be impactful. I want it to make a difference. I want it to be contagious. And I want, I want to have miracles. The miracles that we read about in Corinthians. I want to see ministry done through these people. I want to see miracles done through these people. We want to see gifts done through these. Through me, Lord, do show me the gifts you've given me. Show me the ministry you've given me. Show me the miracles you want to do through me. And God, show the same through these friends. Show them the ministry you've given every one of them. Every one of them. Every one of them you've given a ministry. Every one of them you have miracles that want to come through them. Every one of them, you have gifts you want displayed through them. Different than mine. Different than each other's. Would you show us, God, what the next level looks like for us? Before Brandon comes to pray, every head bowed. If you feel like, I, I need to go to the next level. I need to work out what I believe. I want to believe the right things to become the right person. If that's you, you raise your hand. Just hold it up. Hold it up for a second. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You can put your hands down. Lord, let it be so. Lord, let it be so. Amen. Now, here's what I want to say before we go. We have a baptismal tank here. This is one of those behaviors in Scripture. It doesn't tell us to do 400 things says to have communion together and not forsaken. It says to lay hands on one another and it says for believers to be baptized. So this is one of those things 
where if you say, how do I feel about this? I might feel scared. I might be nervous. I might be kind of delaying it because I don't want to go home wet. And then I say, what do I know though? Well, what I know is scripture tells me to be baptized. What I know is Jesus modeled being baptized. What I know is every great man and woman in history who's ever done anything for God has been baptized. That's what I know. Now, what do I really want? Do I want to be that kind of girl? Do I want to be that kind of guy? What's remarkable to me is everybody signs up, wants to sign up for the miracle. Nobody wants to sign up for the obedience. You don't want to get wet, but you want to be powerful. Crazy. If you're here and you haven't been baptized, don't wait five minutes. Just leave your chair right now. Go over and Brandon will dunk you here. Lord, I sent I sent these people out into a city that needs them. We need you to flow through us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, listen, if you've never been baptized, we would love for you to get baptized. I know that you're like, I don't know when and how and where. Hey, we'll figure it out for you. Uh, it's been so great baptizing people. I'm sure you're going to see a little bit more about that. I want to give you an opportunity to give today. If you've never given, you can text our church to 77977. Listen, the mission of our church to bring the spirit of Jesus. How do we do that? Well, sometimes it's with our hands. Sometimes it's with our feet. Sometimes it's with our money. Our money can go further than our hands and our feet can ever go. And uh, it's because of your faithfulness and your generosity. So thank you for giving today. Thanks for being a part of our church. We love you so much.